Oh, um, really happy that uh, that uh, Jeff's here today with us. Uh, Dr. Jeff Girard is an assistant professor in the Department of Psychology at the University of Kansas. Um, he has dual appointments in both the clinical psychology program and also the brain behavior and quantitative science program, or BBQ, which is an acronym that is near and dear to my heart. Um, Jeff, uh, his work focuses on emotion and how emotions expressed in both verbal and nonverbal behaviors. And he's also interested in interpersonal um, communication and, and how that's uh, influenced by individual differences and social context and, and social factors like that. Um, Jeff's a really good friend of mine. Um, he and I met uh, during our pre-doctoral internship down at the University of Mississippi Medical Center in Jackson, Mississippi. Um, so, you know, it was a great learning experience. It was also a great bonding opportunity for us as uh, two Yankees who spent a year in the buckle of the Bible Belt uh, down in the Deep South. Um, I'm really excited for you guys to meet Jeff. Uh, Jeff has a truly unique skill set. You know, obviously he's trained as a clinical psychologist, but he also has a really strong background in computer science and, and data science. Um, Jeff completed his two-year postdoctoral fellowship at a world-leading computer science lab uh, at uh, Carnegie Mellon University. Um, and he's a great educator. You know, he does workshops uh, about a number of different things, but one of the, the topics that he's truly passionate about is data science. Um, so this is a great opportunity for us uh, where he's gonna talk to us first about uh, how to set up and manage um, data sets. You know, really important things to know that are gonna make your life a lot easier later on. And he'll also talk to us about how to visualize data, um, which is something that's so important, uh, especially because you know it's it's critical that that we make our figures um, intuitively interpretable, and and that is true whether you're presenting your findings to a scientific audience or to a lay audience, um, you know, distributing your uh, findings accurately to the masses, um, especially in a. a a world of fake news and, and uh, distrust of scientists, um, that, that is a critical uh, thing for us to be able to do. So um, that's the introduction in a nutshell. I could go on much longer than that, but for his sake and for your sake, I'll just kind of leave it there. So welcome everyone. I'm really excited to be here. I will do my best to live up to that introduction and all of your expectations. Um, but I think we're in good shape in terms of having a topic that I really like and care about. So be talking today about data design and visualization. And these are kind of big components of, of what I do day to day as a, as a researcher, as a psychologist, and uh, as a data scientist. So I have here a, in, a conceptual introduction to kind of drive home that I'm not going to be talking too much about, you know, the implementation of these things. So we're not going to really talk about software too much. We're not going to talk about coding or programming. Uh, this is more the concepts, the big picture ideas, and I think that that will make this as broadly accessible and useful uh, as possible. So I have two uh, sections of this today. I'm hoping each one will be about 10 to 20 minutes, and then we'll still have time at the end for some Q&A and some discussion. The first part on data design, I'm going to be talking about uh, what are sometimes called the tidy data principles. And this will be a way of thinking about and organizing and designing your data sets so that you can basically set them up in a way that's going to be uh, maximally useful for both humans and for computers. And as we move into the future and technology uh, becomes more and more suffused in our lives, uh, it becomes more and more important to have ways of managing your data and storing your data that is good for computers uh, as well as for, for humans. And then in the second part, part B, I'm going to go into the grammar of graphics, which similarly is a system for understanding, for thinking about, and for communicating about uh, visualizations. So again, I'm not going to go too much into the implementation, uh, although I will have a bunch of resources at the end that I'll recommend, and I'm happy to talk about that in Q&A. Um, but this will again be more uh, big picture, conceptual, how to understand visualizations, and then I'll also wrap up with, I've gone through some of my old papers and pulled out some of my favorite visualizations that um, I think kind of showcase different possibilities and uh, ways that you can use the grammar of graphics to um, 
hopefully pretty good effect. Uh, so I'll let you decide if it was successful or not, but it'll be a, at least a starting point for us to talk about things. Uh, so to begin with, for tidy data, um, I thought we would just begin really broadly with what is a data set? Um, and so basically a data set is a collection of values or a collection of information. So this might take the form of numbers. It might take the form of text data or what are sometimes called strings of characters. And it's yeah, just basically a, a set or a collection of information or data points. And so this hopefully isn't too different of an idea that you've heard before. But what I'm going to give you in this slide is a kind of common vocabulary for thinking about and talking about what is a data set and what are values in the data set that then I can use throughout the rest of this presentation that will get us on the same page and you know, hopefully also allow you to communicate more easily with other people as well. So every value, every kind of individual piece of information will belong to a unit a variable and an observation. And so I'll go through each of these one by one and define them, and I'll give you some examples as well. Um, because this is a college of medicine and I'm a psychologist, most of my examples will be geared towards that space. Um, but if you do different type of work, then um, this will still apply. It's pretty universal, but you'll just have to tweak the examples that you think of. So when I say that every value belongs to a unit, what I basically mean is that we are gathering information or data points from objects or things. Uh, and so again, this might be individuals uh, like a patient or a customer or a research participant. It could be uh, a human or an animal. It could be a group of people. Um, it could be a time frame or a, an object like a, a real document or a electronic document. Uh, it could even be an idea. Uh, but yeah, basically you're going to measure um, or collect information about specific things. And so it's just useful to keep that in mind. What is the actual unit that this data set is describing? Is it describing patients? Is it describing animals? Is it describing uh, months um, or emails or whatever the case may be? Um, and so every value is going to be about a specific unit. Um, every value is also going to belong to a variable. And so what a variable is, is uh, basically contains all of the values, so all of those data points, that measure the same underlying attribute across units. So that's a very kind of fancy way of saying something. It's, it's relatively simple. It's uh, the variable basically is the thing you're measuring. So this might be the height of those people or their weight. It could be the temperature of that time period. It could be the duration of some event. Uh, so there's all sorts of different variables or attributes that we might want to measure. And you know, again, you can imagine that for you know psychology, you might be measuring things like mood or um, academic performance or you know some sort of outcome of a medical treatment. Um, and, you know, so in different in different spaces, you might have different types of units and variables, but this general principle applies regardless. And then finally, every value belongs to an observation. And so an observation contains all measures or all values that are measured on the same unit across attributes. So again, that's a very fancy way of just saying that any time that you collect data, like an occasion that you collect data from a unit, you might collect um, a bunch of attributes or a bunch of values about a bunch of attributes. So one example would be if your unit is patients and your variable is, you know, your variables are heart rate and weight and blood pressure, then an observation might be one time that the patient comes in to the, um, you know, into the doctor's office to get those measurements taken. And so in a specific data set, you might actually have the same person observed multiple times. So you have, you know, what what was my heart rate and my blood pressure on, um, you know, 2002 and then 2003, 2004, and so you have repeated measurements. Um, so those are just repeated observations, uh, even though it's of the same unit. Or you might actually have in, in a data set, you could have multiple different units. So you could have, uh, for instance, you know, three different patients, and then each of them are viewed um, or observed one or more times. 
So again, hopefully, you know, this this general idea that, you know, when you met when you take measurements, you're measuring something um, from something at a specific time. Hopefully that's not too strange of an idea for you, but to formalize it and give it these um, specific words or terms like values, units, variables, observations is, is actually a very powerful thing. So you may come across uh, when talking to different people, talking uh, maybe in working in different fields, you might have different terms for these things. Like in computer science, they don't often use the word variable. They might use the word feature, um, things like that. But mostly we're talking about the same thing. Um, so again, this is a pretty universal, generally applicable uh, framework for thinking about uh, a data set. Um, so hopefully you followed along. If you have uh, questions, um, you, know, uh, you know, feel free to jump in and I'll try to clarify things. But as a starting point, hopefully that makes sense. And now that we have this kind of common language, we can start talking about, you know, what are different ways that we could store this data? So one way is that, let's say we are uh, managing a doctor's office and we have patients come in and we take their blood pressure and their um, their weight and their height measurements. We could put those all on post-it notes and slap them on the wall. And then that could be our data set is all these post-it notes that are around this very colorful room. Um, but you can imagine that might work well for some people, but that's probably not going to work well for everybody. It might be hard to transfer that data to other people. It might be difficult to you know, do statistical analysis of that data or to create figures or visualizations of that data. So what we're going to use in the tidy data principles is a, a common framework for organizing data sets that is going to be, uh, again, generally applicable. And then if everybody learns this system and sort of can assume that that's what most people are going to use, then, you know, we can build software that expects that that'll work right out of the box for that type of data. Um, it's going to be easier to share and, uh, you know, it'll just be very good again for both human consumption and for machine or computer consumption. That would be the ideal. So the tidy data principles, there's five of them. And the first one is that each unit type should have its own what we call table. And so by table, I basically mean uh, something like this, like a spreadsheet where you have uh, data aligned in kind of a grid where every uh, every cell of this grid has you know one value in it. Um, and so I'll talk about this example in a moment. But let's say that you have, you know, again, let's say we're managing a, a medical clinic where we do research, but also see patients. You might have one, you know, set of data that is all about patients. And so then that would be one unit type. And you would want to have one table, so one spreadsheet that's all about patients. And then you might have another data set that's all about staff, you know, doctors and nurses and, and other staff members. And you might want to collect that information as well. But because you might have different information about patients and staff, it'd be better to keep those as separate tables. So uh, there are such things what are called relational databases, where you're trying to tie together tons of different tables. Um, but for now, and I'd say most of the time in, in scientific research, we don't have quite as much data uh, to require that level of sophistication. Usually we can just have a handful of different spreadsheets and that'll that'll do fine. Um, so we want each unit type to have its own table. That's the first one. So in this example, we have uh, looks like glucose and insulin levels from different subjects at different time points. We want each variable to have its own column. So uh, we have a bunch of values here in the first column. All of these values are similar in that they provide the identifier, so a number for each subject. And then time is a you know, number that indicates the time of that observation. So maybe this is subject 321, um, maybe right after something happens, like a drug was administered, and then five minutes later, 15 minutes later, 30 minutes, and so on. And then we have all of these values correspond to glucose levels, and all of these values correspond to insulin levels. Okay. So each variable has its own column. Each observation has its own row. So again, when we actually you know, take measurements from a subject at a given time point, that is one observation. And 
then we have a row for that. So we have a identifier that describes which observation is it, it's this subject, it's this time, and then what the actual measurements are, the glucose and the insulin levels. And you know that's very, very helpful. And then implied by this is each value has its own cell. So then I'm looking and see, okay, what was the uh, glucose level for subject 322 at five minutes post-administration? You could look for 322, five, and then glucose, and then the value of that would be 297.4, okay? Uh, and then one final slide, if you have all of these met, but I'll make it explicit because I'm going to refer to it later, is that your data table should be rectangular. And what I mean by that is you want there to be, you know, the spreadsheet to be full. Um, so there's no empty cells in the middle of this. Um, everything has uh, some sort of value in it, which makes it a big um, rectangle. Um, but sometimes actually, and when you're doing research, it's pretty common actually for there to be times when, you know, for instance, maybe you didn't get the insulin measurement um, for a specific observation for some reason. And that's okay. I mean, again, that's expected sometimes. Um, but in order to have your, your data be tidy, instead of just leaving that cell blank, we want to indicate somehow that that was missing. And so in this example, we have the missing values represented with uh, the code NA for like not available. So you can use different codes, but uh, it's generally a good idea to, to have some kind of indicator like that and also to have it not be a number. Um, if you put all zeros in there or all, you know, 999s or something, um, if anyone ever forgets that those are there and they take like an average or something, then, you know, zeros would bring the average down and 999s would bring the average up. Um, so we don't want that. Whereas with the NAs, they'll hopefully just be ignored and won't kind of influence things. Um, so that, that's the basic idea. And then oh, the last thing too is that it's not necessary to be tidy, but I think it's generally a good idea to have your first row instead of being uh, an observation to just be a, a header row. So it gives a name for, for every variable. So each column, now we can just see within this um, spreadsheet, we know what the columns are. We don't need to go look at another file or anything to orient ourselves. Um, so again, this I think is relatively easy to read as a, as a human. And this is also gonna be very easy to read uh, for a computer. So we've met our goals here. So what I'd like to do now is kind of go through and give you some examples of a kind of a before and after, um, before and after tidying. So I'll give you an example of a data set that um, is not tidy. It kind of violates one or more of these principles. Um, I'll give you a little bit of time to think about what is the problem. Um, if we had, if I had like an hour and a half or two hours, I would actually call on you and see, have people answer. But I think uh, for the sake of time, I want to leave time for Q&A. So I'll just give you the answer. Um, but so here's the first one. So we have, you know, it looks like three different variables, name, age, and weight, and uh, four observations. Um, so this is not tidy. And uh, so think about for a moment, you know, what are the principles that are being violated here? And then uh, if you're feeling ambitious, what might you do to fix that? And what I see here is that we have each row is being represented as a variable and each column is an observation. And that is kind of flipped from what we want. Um, now, you may be thinking it's kind of arbitrary which one becomes a variable and becomes a column. And that's true. Um, but again, because so many uh, people use the tidy format, um, many software packages are going to expect that your data is is tidy. And so if it's not, you could end up with some weird behavior that's uh, not intentional. Um, so even though it is a little arbitrary, that's the convention we have. Um, and so we would want to fix this by kind of rotating or what we call pivoting the data, where you move the name, age, and weight to be columns instead of uh, rows. Okay. So relatively simple, still the same number of values, um, but this will be a lot easier for the computer to work with. Uh, okay, next example, we have uh, the same data, but now in a different format where we have the names across the first row. Uh, and then we have uh, age and weight here in more of the standard kind of tidy format. So the, uh, the issue here is basically that the name variable, name is a variable here, but it's being given a, a row, not a column. And so basically what we have here is like we have a non-rectangular data set. 
um, you know, with these filled in um, red, it still looks rectangular, but if you imagine, you know, circling just the, the non-empty cells, you would have like this, uh, I don't know, flat shape or something, um, hatchet shape. So it's not rectangular, and so we would want to fix this. And again, this is a relatively simple fix. We can just move the name into its own column and line it up, and now we're back to that same uh, example before. And what's kind of interesting here is that we actually have two different um, examples where we have the same exact data and, and it was sort of untidy or problematic in two different ways, but actually making it tidy unifies it into exactly the same set. So it's kind of like that Freud quote that there's uh, many ways to sort of be uh, sick or you know ill uh, and then relatively fewer ways to uh, to be healthy. So that kind of applies to, to data in this case too, or at least data tidiness. Um, okay. Uh, another example, um, this one's a little bit more complicated. There's more going on here, um, but this is about different uh, tuberculosis rates um, in different years in three different countries. And uh, the issue here is even though this is relatively easy for a human to use, uh, this is going to be very hard for a computer to use. And so it's not tidy. It violates some of these principles. Uh, one of the big ones is that uh, we have basically two variables in, in one column here, or similarly, we have two values per cell here. So that's going to violate that rule. And then we also have what are called merged cells, where you have, you know, Afghanistan is only listed once for both of these rows, and Brazil is listed, you know, once for both of these and so on. And so that, that again, is very nice for humans sometimes, but is not good for, for computers. So to fix this, what we can do is we can break apart the cases and population variables into separate columns. And if we wanted to calculate the rate, we could always do that division and add another column that would be the rate. Um, and then to fix the merging, we can just basically repeat those, uh, those values. So it says instead of Afghanistan once, it has it for each row. So it might feel a little wasteful that, you know, we're, we're now repeating this when we didn't have to. Um, but nowadays, space on a hard drive is so cheap that it's not an issue to repeat this kind of thing. Um, and this, again, is just going to be much easier for the computer to handle. And, um, you know, you can imagine things like sorting sometimes have problems when you have merged cells, but sorting without merged cells is very easy. So there's different things you're going to be able to do in this format that are going to work better than in this format. Okay. Uh, uh, two more examples, I believe. Um, this one is basically uh, like a grade book. So let's say you're you're teaching a class, um, a relatively small class of four students, and you have some information about the students' names. You have uh, their grades in both number and letter form, and then you have this color coding for whether each of those students is a psych major or a psych minor or uh, neither or something like that. So this is very common to see this type of thing. Um, especially people when they're new to data um, design, seem to love um, color coding, but computers are not good at reading color coding. Uh, um, so this can be nice for a human sometimes, but this can actually be really confusing for the computer. So we recommend you don't do this. Um, so we also have multiple values per cell again, where you have kind of the, the grade in number format in the same cell as the grade in the letter format. And so that'd be really better split apart. Um, and then, yeah, again, the color coding is just not a great way to, to store data um, and to have it for things like analysis and uh, visualization. So to fix this, what we can do is we can basically break the color coding out into a new variable. And you can have, you know, basically a psych variable. And then instead of color coding each, you can just list that Amber is a psych major and Bristol is a psych minor, Charlene is a psych major, and then for Diego, um, this legend is a little ambiguous, so it's not clear is is it missing? Like we don't know if Diego is, or does no, no color mean that you know Diego's neither? Um, so that's kind of unclear. I'm going to assume that it's missing and do NA here, and then we can just break apart the grades and the letters, uh, the grades in number format and letter format. Um, so yeah, so basically the the one thing I would like you hopefully to take away from this is that there's almost never a reason that you need a color coding. Um, because again, you can just represent this um, same exact information in a much clearer way like this. Um, if you want to use something like conditional formatting where 
you know, you you make like it is actually stored this way, um, but then you color it so that all the majors here are yellow and all the minors are blue. Like I'm I'm more okay with that um, because the computer can ignore that um, and it would just be for humans. But um, you know, you should always have it be actually stored uh, the data be stored explicitly. Okay. All right, one more example. Uh, and this one's kind of a doozy. There's a lot going on here. And again, this is sort of that grade book, but now it, it's a bit more expanded. And the issue here, or some of the issues, um, are that we have some empty cells, which we don't want, that would break kind of the rectangular format. We have some comments here. So the I guess this teacher was pleased that there were two A's, and so wrote yay in there. Uh, so that would be like a comment. Um, we also have two different unit types in the same table. So we have kind of student data at the top and then more data about the class down here or about the different letter grades here. And so again, that first tidy data principle was that unit types should have their own tables. Uh, and so this would violate that. And then finally, we have the color coding again, um, which is sometimes called formatting as data. So color is like a formatting option and we're using that to store data. So we'd want to kind of clean all this up. And what I would do is basically break these into two separate tables. So we have a student table that has, you know, the student, the grade, the letter. And then for the color coding, this was basically, uh, was it revised or not? It's so like did the, maybe the student, you know, refill this in. And then we can just have true and falses here or ones and zeros or something like that to represent that. And uh, then for the class summary, we can have a separate table where we have the A's, the B's, the C's, the D's, and then counts. And then you could always have a notes column here where you could put in whatever you want. And actually, when you're collecting data in particular, it's actually often useful to have the ability to put in notes. Um, and so it's not, it's not that notes are a bad thing. It's that they should just be separated. So have a separate column for that, and then you could put in whatever. And then typically, the computer will just ignore that. And that'll be more for your human uh, use. Um, so yeah, so that, that's just some basic examples of uh, kind of data design. This is again on the relatively uh, low end or simple end of data design. It's basically how do you figure out what types of um, you know tables to use, what variables and observations should you set up. Um, but yeah, I really recommend that you take some time whenever you're you know planning a new study to really put some thought into, you know, what will my observations be? What variables do I need? Um, should these be one table or multiple tables? Uh, and just put some thought into it because it's one of those things where like a little thought at the beginning is going to save you a lot of trouble and work down the road. Um, I'll also say too that a lot of these things like the, the tidying aspect of things, like so manipulating a data set to, to make it tidy, there are are great tools to help you do that. Uh, some of them through programming, some of them through more point and click options. So if you're interested in learning more about that, please let me know and I can give you some pointers. Um, but for now, again, we're keeping this very conceptual. So um, this is more, more of if somebody you know, may ask you to help on the, on the analysis or the visualization, typically the first step would be to understand the data and then tidy it. Uh, and then you can go on to modeling or uh, visualization. All right, so that's the first section. Uh, again, for time, I think I'm gonna go ahead and just continue on and then have all of the discussion at the end, if that's okay. Um, but I'm very open to questions and uh, things like that. So, uh, you know, take some notes if you have questions and I'll, I'll be sure to try to answer them afterwards. Um, so the second part of this is now that we, let's say, have a tidy data set, uh, one thing that can be very useful is basically, uh, if you want to gain insights or initial uh, understanding from your data, try to understand maybe the uh, the shape of a variable, like what values does it take on, or um, the relationship between two or more variables. Uh, often a really powerful way to do that is to create a visualization, you know, so some sort of a graph or chart or graphic, many words for the same idea. and the basic uh, intuition behind this is that if I were to just give you a big spreadsheet of data points, for you to look at that would be very, very difficult to really draw conclusions from. 
um, because we're not really evolved to look at data in that way. However, we actually have had quite a bit of evolution built into optimizing our visual system. And to be able to basically compare things like lengths and colors and, uh, you know, sizes, things like that, we actually have evolved uh, actually an enormous amount of real estate in, in the brain to uh, optimize those types of tasks. And so the idea behind visualization is that we can capitalize on or leverage, use that, uh, you know, investment that evolution made into all of this uh, visualization stuff to, uh, you know, make quick kind of snap judgments about data. And that can be a very powerful way to, uh, again, communicate and gain insight from, from your data. So I really love visualization. It's tricky to get well. There's definitely an element of art to it, but there's also an element of science. There's some principles. And so that's what I'm going to talk about here with the grammar of graphics. Um, so just like I began before with what is a data set, I want to begin with what is a data visualization. And so I have a, so a bunch of examples here where I have at the top, we have something that is a data visualization. And then on, on below it in the second row, we have something that looks very similar in form, but is not. It's more of like modern or pop art. And so as I kind of flip through these, I want you to just think about uh, what what actually d distinguishes these things? Because again, in form, they're pretty similar, but uh, clearly the top ones are data visualizations and then clearly the bottom ones are not. Um, so here we have you know one type of chart. Here we have another type of chart. Here we have another type of chart. And here we have another type of chart. And so this also kind of goes to show just the, the wide range of, of opportunities and uh, variety that data visualizations come in. Uh, so really the sky's the limit, um, but that also kind of makes it a little bit challenging for us to think about, well, what, what makes these things common when they, they look so different? Um, and hopefully this isn't too much of a surprise, but um, the, the secret is in the name that basically data visualizations um, are different from art by being explicitly connected to data, right? They're visualizing data. Um, so whereas art, you're more placing these shapes um, by and these colors just by sort of aesthetic sensibility with data visualization you are doing this in a very systematic way in order to represent um, you know values and variables and observations things like that okay so let's talk about uh, the grammar of graphics so the basic idea with the grammar of graphics is that there are some types of charts that are so common and they're taught in like, you know, grade school and high school um, that almost everybody can look at this chart on the left and kind of understand what it means. And they, they even probably have a name for it. Like, you know, that's a scatter plot. Um, and then the one on the right is, is so common that people are familiar with it as like a bar chart or a column chart or a candlestick chart. You know, there's different names for these things. Um, but again, these are so common that it's, it's relatively easy to think about them and communicate um, what they are. So if I were to tell you that there's a scatter plot um, or a bar chart, you probably know what I mean. Um, and you know, and there's relatively simple rules for what makes a good um, scatter plot or bar chart. Um, but just like the uh, just like languages um, have a grammar, which is a basically a system of rules that let you combine, you know, elements of of language into you know more correct, um, broader ideas like sentences and paragraphs. Um, the grammar of graphics gives us a, a system, a rule set for how we combine elements of, uh, you know, graphics uh, to create a more holistic, um, you know, data visualization or graphic. So that's the basic idea. So I'm going to, just like I kind of showed you these tidy data principles, I'm going to give you this grammar of graphics, which is a set of principles for thinking about, understanding, and communicating about, uh, about figures. So again, we don't really need the grammar graphics that much for these very simple cases like scatter plots or bar charts, but there's other types of figures that uh, like these examples that are more complex and they're difficult to put a single name to. Um, so they're, they're hard to kind of categorize or put into a bucket. So this one on the left actually has a lot of similarities to the scatter chart, but has some pretty important differences too, right? So there's all these dots or points representing observations, uh, but now we have color and lines and these error bands around the lines. And it seems like the lines are connected to the colors. 
Um, so it's there's just a lot going on. And for some purposes, this might actually do a really good job of, again, giving you insight into the data. Um, like, for instance, this is a, each of these points is a car model. And then we can see that the, the larger the engine, the, the displacement of the engine, uh, typically the less fuel efficient um, that engine is. But it also depends somewhat on the number of cylinders in the engine. Um, so for the eight cylinder engines, the really big engines, uh, that's not always the case. Um, so we can get some insight from this, which is interesting. Um, um, but again, it's hard to it's harder to kind of understand how to talk or, un or think about this kind of chart. Uh, similarly, this is actually the same data as those bar charts, but presented in a very different way. Um, and again, it's hard to really put a name to this. Um, you know, if you're very familiar with data visualization, you can say there's elements here that are, you know, kind of seem like a violin chart or a, a jitter point or something. Um, but it's, you know, it's very complex. So it'd be really nice if we had a way of breaking these more complex ideas into smaller elements um, and then being able to think and talk about those smaller elements and having kind of rules for how to combine them. And that's, again, what the grammar of graphics gives us. So we'll return to these later on, and it'll, we'll have the tools in about, I don't know, five, 10 minutes to talk about these, I think, much better than, than we can right now without them. So there are four basic elements to the grammar of graphics. Um, so I'll talk about these uh, in turn. Um, I have a slide on each. Uh, but we have data, aesthetic mappings, scales, and geometric objects. Um, there's also, if you want to get more advanced, there's some other elements like coordinate systems and statistics and facets and themes that we could get into as well. Um, I'm not going to talk about that today just to keep this more introductory, but um, just so you know, there's, there's a lot of um, possibility here. Um, so the first element is that, again, what makes a data visualization uh, what it is, uh, is that it's tied to data. So we need to start with the data, of course, and that'll be defined um, using that same system uh, that we talked about before, where we have values, we have observations, we have variables. Uh, and so that's why I wanted to go through the, that first before we got into visualization. Uh, and so there's different forms that you can store data in, depending on the software you're using, for instance. Um, but so here I use a program called R, and so the data looks like this. But yeah, basically we have um, a whole bunch of observations, 234 of them. Each one is a model of car. And then we have 11 variables that describe those models of car. So things like what's the manufacturer, what's the model name, what's the engine size, what's the year, what's the number of cylinders, and so on. And so we could hopefully find a way to represent some of this information visually. Because again, if I just show you a spreadsheet like this, and I ask you, you know, do bigger engines have worse fuel efficiency? Um, it's going to be really hard to tell. Um, First of all, because it's not showing the fuel efficiency in this display, that would make it especially hard. Um, but even if it were, it would be difficult to, to take away that kind of uh, insight just from a, a table. But a chart is going to allow us to do that really easily. Um, but in order to do that, we need to use these other elements. So the next element is uh, what are called the aesthetic mappings. So what we need to do is we need to basically take each variable that we want to represent visually, and we need to determine what visual quality, or what we call an aesthetic, do we want to use to represent its different values? So again, if we have something like a, uh, a variable like the size of the engine, some engines are smaller than others. And so we want to have some way of representing, is this a small or a large or a medium engine? And so we could do that with different aesthetics. Some very popular aesthetics that are often used are things like position, so we might have bigger engines to the right and smaller engines to the left, or bigger engines uh, uh, up more and smaller engines down more. Um, those are often called the X and Y uh, coordinates or axes. You can have different shapes, maybe for different numbers of cylinders. You can have different sizes. You can have maybe like the bigger engines have larger dots or something. You can have different colors. Uh, maybe each manufacturer has a different color. You can have different line widths, different line types. So there's all sorts of aesthetics you can use. But the basic idea is you want to use one of these visual qualities to represent variation in a variable. Um, so again, you have different manufacturers. Those are represented by different colors. You have different engine sizes. Those are represented by um, the position on a horizontal axis, um, that kind of thing. 
Uh, so again, there's other aesthetic mappings, but these are the most common ones that you would typically use. And then once we've determined that, let's say we want, um, let's say the horizontal axis to represent the uh, size of the engine, now we need to determine, you know, how much. So if you have, for instance, you know, uh, an engine that is one liter larger, how, how many spaces, like inches or pixels, should we move on the horizontal axis? And that's what a scale gives us. So we have basically now uh, a form of specific values in the data space um, that are being mapped to specific values in the aesthetic space. So basically, again, saying that this much distance, you know, maybe like two inches on my screen or 200 pixels or something, is equivalent to or representing uh, two liters of difference in engine size. Um, so that's the basic idea. So this is, you know, again, what's sometimes called, um, you know, a, a Cartesian coordinate system, but basically an X and Y axis um, is, is a way of, of scaling um, the X and Y um, or, you know, positional uh, aesthetics. Uh, but we also need to do this not just for position, but for other things too. So if we have color, for instance, we might have one color, um, like red, represent four cylinder engines, and then green represents six, and blue represent eight. Uh, and so this would be useful if you have uh, what are called dis uh, discrete values. So if your car either has four or six or eight cylinders, but not you know, four and a half cylinders or something like that, um, then you could have just three separate colors. Whereas sometimes you actually have a more continuous scale where, you know, you can have, again, your engine size might be anywhere from, you know, two to seven liters, and, and it could be 2.1 or 2.3 uh, or anywhere between those. And so then instead of having separate colors, you would have more of a gradient um, that blends between those colors. Uh, you can also have different shapes. Um, you can have different sizes. Uh, but again, what the scale does is it allows you to, again, say that this specific shape means this specific number of cylinders, or this specific color means this specific number of cylinders, that kind of thing. OK, so now that we've basically set up uh, a, a system of saying, this is the data we want to plot, and this is basically how we're going to turn those values into uh, visual things uh, using the aesthetic mappings and the scales, uh, we now need to actually plot something. We need to actually draw objects uh, in that space. And so these are called geoms. And so there's a ton of flexibility here. You could have, let's say, each observation uh, is represented by a single line or a single point, uh, like a, a single shape. You can have ribbons. You can have bars. You can have intervals, like error bars. You can have uh, curves or densities. You can have box plots, violin um, plots. You can plot text uh, in different parts of the, uh, so instead of maybe putting a dot for each car, you could put the name of the car uh, at different points of the um, uh, of the part of the chart. Uh, you can even have uh, complex shapes to represent like regions on a map. Um, so there's all sorts of different options and you can combine these in some really interesting ways. Um, so that that's the basic idea. Um, but but now we actually have the ability to, by referencing aesthetic mapping scales and geoms, um, and geometric objects are often shortened to geoms, we can actually really quickly uh, communicate uh, a pretty complicated figure. So again, if we return to this, now we can actually say something like, you know, we have uh, the displacement variable being mapped to the x-axis. We have the highway fuel efficiency variable being mapped to the y-axis. And then we have cylinders being mapped to a color scale. And then we have uh, several geoms here. We have some point geoms where each car is a, is a circle. We have uh, some what are called smooth geoms that are kind of like a line of best fit. Um, and then an error bar around that line of best fit. Um, and so basically, what, what if you were to like take a class with me where I taught you how to actually implement this, um, one of the things we do in that class is I will tell the students, um, you know, draw me a plot from this data set that does those mappings. And then if everybody is sort of paying attention, um, actually everyone in the class will be able to create the exact same figure, even from a pretty vague verbal description, uh, which is, again, really powerful and quite, quite interesting. Uh, and then here again, we now have the ability to say, okay, 
So there's, um, you know, it seems like cylinders have these, you know, across the x-axis here, what's called facets. Uh, highway fuel efficiency is the y-axis. And then we have these geoms of like a violin plot here in white, and then these points in black, and then a summary here, which is the mean of each of these in as a big red dot. Um, so again, so for, so for something like this, you have to get into some of the more advanced um, elements to fully describe. Um, but hopefully it's kind of clear how um, this type of system is allowing you to very precisely um, think about and talk about uh, pretty complex figures, um, which, which is a very cool thing. So the last thing I want to do, and I realize we're uh, coming up on the end of time, uh, but I'll go through these quickly. Is I, again, I just want to show you a couple examples from my work um, to kind of show you different things that I think you can achieve uh, with, with these principles. Uh, so the first one, uh, as Dr. Sprunger said, I, I study uh, nonverbal behavior um, in part. And uh, so I have, uh, I did a project recently where we tried to basically collect images of celebrities uh, all across the world. And I wanted to represent uh, how many celebrities we got from each country. So I had a, a map uh, of the world that I got, and then I colored each country uh, in this continuous color scale based on how many celebrities I got from each of those countries. Uh, and so this was actually a really powerful way to show that, you know, we actually got pretty good data from all around the world, but some areas were better represented than others. Like North America and Australia was pretty good. Um, Africa did have most of the countries, or Africa had most of the countries represented, although there are some missing ones, but they were represented to a lesser degree, okay? So this is a, uh, someone had mentioned big data before. I'm also interested in big data. So this was like, you know, hundreds of thousands of data points um, from all around the world, was, which was pretty cool. And then what we wanted to do was see, you know, do men and women in these different countries uh, smile more or less. Um, and so that's what this was about. So we have a plot here where each of these points is a uh, country. And then the size of that dot represents how many people were from that country. So basically the bigger points uh, are sort of more trustworthy because we had more people to, to draw from. Um, and then we have uh, men and women on the left and right. And then we have their average smile intensity. And so you can see that on average, uh, women tended to smile more than, than men uh, in all these different countries, not in all, but in, in most of them. But one of the things about this left-hand chart that I didn't like was that each of these dots uh, actually is like the same country. So I wanted to find some way to connect them. So what I was able to do instead of this approach is this, where you have men um, versus women. And so then instead of having a separate dot on the left and right for each country, you just have one dot per country. And then where in the space it is shows you the difference between men and women. So if you're above the diagonal, that means that in that country, women tended to smile more than men. And below means uh, men tended to smile more than women. Um, and so then you can see very clearly that you know, almost all the countries were uh, showed that uh, women smiling more than men effect. Uh, so that, that was pretty cool. And I thought a nice a nice visualization. Um, this is a, actually a collaboration with Dr. Sprunger, uh, not published quite yet, but we had people with PTSD write essays about their experiences with PTSD. And then we uh, analyzed the presence of different emotions in those essays. And so then you can see uh, before and after treatment. So time one is before, time two is after. And so you can kind of see in the violin plots what the distribution of each emotion was before. Um, but then you also can see for each individual participant, you have a line in kind of blue or green here that shows their change. Um, and then the average line is in red. Um, so again, this kind of shows how you can visualize, you know, patterns of change and also kind of uncertainty or uh, variability in, in change across people, which I think is quite. Um, here's another one. I think this is my last one, and then I'll, I promise I'll <laughs> open it up, and I'm happy to stay a little bit longer if other people can. Um, and so this was basically a, a longitudinal study of, of depression treatment. And so we have people's um, severity of depression at different time points. And so I was able to basically represent each of these lines is a single patient. And so we have, you could see this, this person went from being severe to severe, to uh, mo moderate, to, oops, to moderate. Uh, and similarly, so you can kind of see the, the distribution of uh, the different classes at each time point. 
um, which you would get with these bars. But then by connecting them with these kind of flow things, you also can kind of actually see the change in each individual person over time, which I thought was was pretty powerful. Um, so yeah, so anyway, uh, some resources, if you wanna learn more about um, tidy data, uh, these two journal articles are very short, so I really recommend them. Um, and then if you want more uh, long form treatment, uh, R for Data Science is an excellent book for learning about how to actually implement um, a lot of the tidying stuff. And then for uh, design and plotting, uh, ggplot2 is the program I use in R, the software I use to actually make all the charts that you saw in this uh, presentation. And uh, so this book is very helpful for that. Uh, for a more general purpose take on visualization principles, Fundamentals of Data Visualization is a new book that's quite good. And then for general um, design um, advice, so not specific to figures, but just in general for making good presentations and things like that, the non-designers design book is, is a great resource. Um, the other ones are free. You can just read them online, which is really cool. This one you'd have to buy, but uh, I think it's worth it. So uh, I apologize for going right to the end of the time that we had. But um, again, I'm, I'm happy to stay a bit longer if other people can. I'm happy to chat. So thank you very much for, for your attention.